right, everybody, welcome to Virtual Bourbon. My name is Steve Akeley. We have a fun event tonight. We're going to be trying some Canadian club. We're going to go back and try some vintage era stuff versus today's and see what uh, if there is a difference. I have no idea. I don't know how Canadian club promotes themselves, if they try to be very consistent through the years or they don't. So this is a very different animal for us. And then, of course, we're doing it blind. So and I don't really know that I have a point of reference. I've drank Canadian club, but it's been, ooh. 25 years i mean it's been a long time since i've even even tasted it so uh yes it should be fun to try to play this game and see how we do and of course as always uh our host for this evening is wes harden and he always brings a little bit of history with this too so hey wes how you doing man hey steve how's it going guys good good so yes uh canadian club what uh, you dug into this is, is it going to be interesting is there some good stuff here yeah there's some it's so it's one of those as we've if we've done a lot of these um bourbon history dusty events what we find out is a lot of the brands that have been around for a long time they're either they're split into two categories they've either been through a lot of different hands and therefore there's a lot of different parts of history that add to the story where they started off as this and they changed to that and so and so purchased them and so forth and then the other side of the coin are these these brands that have literally been around and not changed hands been in the same distillery or under the same ownership or whatever and even though it's a long history a lot of times it's 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 not a it's not a a, a laundry list of interesting facts uh, but this one here is kind of a combination of the two so i think there's going to be some cool little tidbits uh that i bring out that's going to be interesting to you guys uh it's uh little more a little more in depth than, than i thought it was going to be so yeah uh, i'm so trying cool. to do something more intimate here too wes i mean obviously we have 40 50 people on here i'm yep. just showing four on the screen so it, it you know so we can really focus in on the presenter. yes the lo it's the lottery winners they won, yes. they won the secret yes. lottery to be on stage yeah yeah so that's that's also like a it. bonus so yeah all right are we ready to go here yes well, i think what i want to do is um I kind of changed it around a little bit. We did this the last event. I think let's start off with uh, with doing a little drinking and nosing. And then while we're doing that, I'll start into uh, what we've got. So again, this is blind. You have a, a sample, should be a sample one and two or a sample A and B. I can't remember how I numbered it, but. Um, like one and two. Yeah, one and two. That's what I thought. One and two. That's what mine say, so I wanted to make sure. Yeah, so we are, again, we are blind sampling and comparing a current right off the shelf Canadian club and then a 1960 dusty Canadian club, yeah. uh, which is uh, pretty cool. Both are uh, a blend of Canadian whiskey and uh, neutral grain spirits. So they're not a straight Canadian whiskey. Uh, they do have, what I noticed when I was looking uh, at the liquor store, they currently do have uh, age stated uh, they have an eight-year age stated that is still a blend of uh, whiskey and neutral grain, but then they have like an 18 and a 23-year higher end that are a blend of straight Canadian uh, whiskeys. Oh, no neutral uh, grain in that one? Uh, that the, the high, I think the 23-year-old did not have any neutral grain. Okay. So it's kind of the, the top of the line, for lack of a better term, for Canadian mm -hmm. club. Uh, but yeah, let's, uh, so we'll start with uh, number one. Uh, the one thing I notice immediately, and it's kind of what you expect when you when you are blending with neutral grain, is pretty light in appearance, kind of a a hay straw kind of. It's yeah. not it, it's not super light, but it's not bourbon dark. I guess is kind of where I'm going with it. Yeah. But what's interesting about it, and I'm I really don't personally have a lot of history with neutral grain spirits. I've never never was an Everclear person. Never was like a white whiskey. Um, kind of thing and never really got into a lot of drinking things that were blended um, uh, like Seagram 7 and things like that so to me I was actually expecting a very medicinal alcohol nose but I really didn't get that at least on this first one no no uh, for me I get some some peaches there which is uh yeah it's kind of kind of strange kind of, kind of a little sweet. bit of that fruit for sure mm -hmm. I don't really get uh, it definitely does not smell like a bourbon to me no, no, does I not. don't get anything from, you know, I don't get any of the, of the vanillas or the caramels. This is, uh, smells light and crisp, I think, for lack of better terms, which is probably yeah. that fruit note you're talking about. Yeah. 
Bob, mm-hmm. Rick, uh, you guys are on stage. What are you? What are you guys getting out of that? Oh, a little fruit. Yeah, but it, it's it's got a real light nose. I mean, yeah, it's not. Uh, <laughs> again, maybe it's just my lack of knowledge of neutral green spirits, but I was expecting the nose to be very methanol alcoholic, but I don't really get anything uh, like that on the nose. I just get that kind of really sweet, light, crisp uh, fruit note. Yeah. The nose is very faint. So I'm, I'm obviously not using a proper glass for nosing. I <laughs> <laughs> don't think even if I had a, a solo party there, cup be, there. Yeah. I'd be yeah. Picking yeah. Up yeah. Your nose. <laughs> right. Closer yeah. to it than I get it with the Glen Karen. So I was like, yeah. Surprisingly, that's uh, a little better than I thought it was going to be. Actually, yeah, it it's it's uh, definitely fruity on the taste. Yep, fruity mm-hmm. on the taste with just uh, just a little bit of uh, a little bit of punch at the end. Mm-hmm. But uh, again, you know, I guess you know this is probably where Canadian whiskey, uh, very similar to Irish whiskey and scotch in the world in, the, in relation to more of a blending uh, exercise as opposed to uh, single barrels and, and, and things of that nature. So, you know, Canadian whiskey and, and Canadian distillers are always big into, uh, always big into blending and, and, and much like the, the Irish whiskey and the scotch guys are. So this is, you know, probably a credit to picking you know, really good barrels of Canadian whiskey and meshing those uh, at the proper ratio with the neutral green spirits to get uh, it's actually a pretty pleasant drink, I think. Yeah. Yeah. More pleasant than I would have thought. I've, I've never had Canadian Club before. I hadn't either. I was, I'm actually pretty surprised, to be honest with you. Well, I mean, I can never think a, why. <laughs> when I was a kid, there was always a bottle of Canadian Club in the house. That's one of the whiskeys that my dad drank uh, almost exclusively that okay. in ancient age. So ancient I remember, age, okay. I mean, this, this is a familiar taste, but uh, much fainter than I remember. There's just not a lot of, not a punch to it. Yeah. You know what? I could see this. And, and I would say in most examples, like when I'm talking about bourbon, I don't think you could ever substitute bourbon for a, uh, like a beach drink. You know, one of the, the you yeah. know, rum type of each. I feel like this you could with that absolutely, and it's a little bit lighter. I feel like if you want something that more a little bit more resembles whiskey, yeah, I think you could you could replace this with that. You know, I, I'm not a fan of the drink uh, because I'm not a vegetable juice kind of guy. Uh, but you know, like you could probably mix this with something that typically has a little more spice to it, like a Clamato drink and like a Bloody Mary or something. It probably, you know, offset and, and you could, you know, use it in something like I that. I was like Bloody well. Marys as those gins. Mm-hmm. Okay. Those are... All right. Well, I'll tell you what, let's, while you guys continue sipping and nosing that one, let's get into a little bit of the history. So okay. talking about Canadian club, uh, it was created by Hiram Walker. So, you know, people in the, in the bourbon world, uh, <laughs> that know a little about dusties and so forth. There was actually uh, a bourbon brand called Hiram Walker, uh, very popular in the 50s, 60s, 70s, up until uh, kind of the bourbon uh, boom stopped in the, the 70s into the 80s. Uh, the Hiram Walker bourbon uh, was made in Peoria, Illinois at the American uh, Distilling Company there, uh, the great big distillery in Peoria. Uh, and it was one of their bigger brands, actually. Uh, it has nothing, it was not owned by um, the same people that did Canadian Club. Uh, it was just to pay homage to Hiram Walker and the history that he brought to uh, the American and North American whiskey industry. But for what we're drinking, uh, Hiram Walker created uh, Canadian Club in 1858 but it was created in Detroit, not Canada. So it was a piece of kind of a cool piece of information. Hmm. Michigan started voting counties to go dry uh, in the early 1900s. And, and Michigan was one of, not the first, but they were one of the first states that uh, voted in for prohibition. So they started voting to go dry. And when they did, he saw the writing on the wall and he moved 
uh, he moved to Windsor and he actually created a little town called Walkerville, which is basically now it's annexed into Windsor. It was annexed into Windsor back. Oh man, I think it was like the sixties or something like that. The fifties or the sixties, but, uh, he actually built a distillery from the ground up right there across the river, uh, in what is now Windsor. He grew his own grains. He milled his own flour. He actually raised livestock uh, that would feed and eat off the spent mash. And uh, he created uh, that distillery there. It's called the Walkerville Distillery uh, right there in Windsor. Uh, interestingly enough is he was really good friends with Henry Ford, which makes sense because of Detroit guys, automotive yeah, industry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Thomas Edison of all people. So he, you know, he rubbed elbows with some pretty, uh, influential, highfalutin people of the time, very successful, uh, generally considered genius uh, level people, at least in industry and uh, and innovation and engineering. That would be uh, fun to see those guys oh, hanging out, right? Right. I know, right? Yeah. Like just sitting around drinking right. Canadian Club or whatever the you know, yeah. whatever the case may be. I think uh, wasn't it wasn't like the Goodyear guy or one of them also friends with him. One of the tire guys was. was yeah, Goodyear. they they were all. Yeah, they were all. Was, it, was it Goodyear, group. Bob? Yeah, it was good year. They, they they went camping together a lot. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, yep. they, they they would hang out and so yeah. And I think that distillery is still there. It is. Uh, so I, I went there one time uh, with the family, and, and this is after I you know was into bourbon and stuff like that. Tour just I want to see if there's a difference, but they would not let me go on a tour because I had a kid. And uh, you know the, the American distilleries, you can take a kid on the tour and stuff like that. They would not let you. So we didn't, didn't go on the tour. I mean, I visited the gift shop and all that, but you know, didn't, didn't get to see how it was made. Yeah. It's still there. It's a, uh, it's a Canadian national historic site, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, and they've got, uh, they obviously have a tour and they've built like, uh, I guess they call it like a historic educational center there where, uh, it just tells the history of Hiram Walker and Canadian club and, and the whole nine yards. A couple of interesting things. Uh, there was a hidden tunnel in the basement and they used that during prohibition for bootlegging. <laughs> and the whiskey was shipped through the tunnel by horse and buggy, as opposed to driving it across in car. It was uh, taken by horse and, yeah, yeah. horse and buggy un right under the Detroit river, right over into wow. Detroit. And, uh, and so ironically, and it makes total sense, one of his biggest clients was none other than Al Capone. Yeah. Well, makes big sense. Time, big time, uh, big time client. I know in, uh, in the movie Untouchables, they did that scene where they were at the American Canadian border with the Mounties and all that jazz. And it, and it made it look like they were way out in the boondocks in the countryside and so forth. And that was, uh, they just did that scene just for theatrics, but basically, uh, all of the Canadian whiskey, including a uh, Canadian club that Al Capone and his people bootlegged, came through that basement uh, distillery through the underground tunnel. And uh, based on what I saw, they, that tunnel was never found out by the cops or the cops that knew about it were paid off, you know, the whole scam back then. Right. Uh, but yeah, that was pretty, uh, that was pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, Hiram Walker passed in 1899. So all of this, uh, uh, all of this dealing with prohibition, Al Capone. There's actually his sons were the ones that uh, worked with Al Capone, and the distillery passed on to him. It continued making Canadian Club post prohibition uh, all the way up until I think it was sometime in the '80s when Jim Beam was running around buying all these labels and brands. Jim Beam actually owns Canadian Club. I had no idea. No, oh, really? Huh. Yes, they own it. And uh, and it's know. actually their fourth highest selling product in their portfolio behind Jim Beam Bourbon. Okay. Salsa Tequila and De Kuiper Cordials. I had oh. no idea. I had no idea. Wow. wow. I had no idea either. So that's interesting. Uh, it, it, it make, it, I guess it makes sense. You know, it's uh, Canadian Club's a pretty big brand. Uh, but if you think about it, it's it's kind of like the Jim Beam of Canadian whiskeys. Like it's it's cheap on the shelf. It's on bars at restaurants, and you know it's 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 just kind of everywhere. And it's uh, you know it's not uh, it's not a street whiskey. It's not an age stated. It's not a high premium. It's just something that's always out there, and it's got its loyal following. Clearly, if it's the fourth highest selling product in Jim Beam's portfolio, that's a pretty big 
comment there alone. Yeah. Uh, and it's kind of the, it kind of makes sense if you think about what Jim Beam does and what products they, they own. They are, you know, at least in the bourbon industry that are probably the, the flagship distillery and company for every day, every man's bourbon, you know, affordable bourbon on the shelf everywhere you can find it. So it's kind of interesting. I had no idea that Jim Beam owned the label, uh, but I don't think they own the distillery. There's some sort of scenario where the distillery is like a contract manufacturer, but Jim Beam ultimately owns the labels the way it works. Uh, interestingly enough, and I couldn't find a whole lot about it as far as where, but in 1967, they went through this campaign that was called hide a case campaign. And so these, these people from, um, from Hiram Walker slash Canadian club would hide cases of Canadian club all over the world. And they would put hints in like newspapers and radio ads. And like people would go on these safaris, like, like not an actual safari, but you know, like right, a risky right. safari and they would find these cases and supposedly there are a couple of cases somewhere in Europe and they don't know where they're at, but they evidently weren't all found. There's still some that are just out there lost in never, never land. And it's like a whole thing where these people like go on these trying to track it down, Yeah, huh? go on these treks to try to track down these 1960s cases of Canadian club for whatever that's worth. It's just, it's kind of weird. Like I don't, you, I don't think you would ever be able to get away with that now especially in the, the U S you would never be able to get away with it because of the three tier system and three tiered system and potential for kids to get. Yeah, it. exactly. But I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that can go wrong there. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine like picking up your newspaper or turning on your radio and yeah, the clue of the day for the Canadian club is blah, blah, blah. And you have to fill yeah. these riddle. Like it's, it's weird. It's very strange. I, I went, tried to go down the rabbit hole on it. And I couldn't find a whole lot about it. It was just brief mentions of it here or there. So it sounded like it was, it, it did not happen in the U S it doesn't sound like it sounds like it was uh, in Canada and then mostly in Europe uh, and, and overseas, but uh, just a, just a weird, weird scenario. I don't really know why they would do that other than just maybe, you know, in the days before they had brand ambassadors and so forth, that's the way you get the word out to the world is you just plant cases of whiskey and weird countries. And, you know, I don't know if they had a case under the Eiffel tower and they had some, on the Canadian side of Niagara Falls and they had them at the pyramids or whatever the case may be, but yeah, they had a the, hide a case the, campaign. The only place that, that is even close to that today is hard truth distilling at Easter. They do a, a beer hunt. So they, they hide beer, you know, they're in like 365 acres in the woods and they hide beer throughout the whole place and things like that. And, uh, but it's a private event. So not a, you, right. know, I, you keep kids out and it's just adults are looking for it, but yes. Yeah, so, so yeah, they hide. And uh, I don't know. I always think, man, that'd be fun to go to and whatever you find, you get to keep. And uh, Brian Smith, who's the distiller there is like every once in a while, they'll be going through the woods and be like, wait, there's a, there's a bottle of beer. <laughs> Someone didn't find this one. <laughs> A lot better than hard boiled eggs. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. yeah. The only the only thing close to that I've heard is here in Louisville area. Two years ago, I think it was before COVID, so it had to be two years ago. The couple of weeks uh, before Easter and on Easter Sunday, the liquor barn locations would go out. Oh yeah, this didn't hide. work out too well though. <laughs> yeah, it didn't. It didn't work out very well. They had people lingering in the store for hours and like it became like this whole stalker situation where they just had some, like some zombies fights, fights yeah they were stuff what yeah there were people like literally like zombies just like walking aimlessly waiting for someone to drop a, a bottle of something but yeah that's the only thing i've even come close to hearing as far as like a, a go hunt and fetch liquor yeah type of scenario so yeah, I mean, ultimately, uh, again, it's they have an interesting history. There's not they didn't change hands a bunch. They didn't, you know, other than the the distillery move pre prohibition from Detroit over to Canada. Uh, they've been in that location since. Uh, you know, they like a lot of labels and so forth uh, back in the '70s and '80s. Uh, they all got sucked up into the big corporations like Suntory. Beam Centauri, uh, but that's really, uh, they've just been one of those consistent uh, North American whiskey blends on the shelf. Uh, I've never heard, I've never had Canadian Club before tonight's event, 
but I've heard of it. I know what it is. I know the bottle when I see it. Right. It's just one of those that's that's out there, and you know, it's like uh, it's like anything else. There's people uh, whose granddad drink it, and then their dad drink it, and because they did, that was their first drink. You know, around here, you get more of that with Makers and Jim Beam and Wild Turkey. But uh, I could see, especially in the northern states, you know, Michigan, New York, any any of the northern states boarding Canada. Uh, I can imagine there's quite a bit of people on the U.S. side whose first drink of any whiskey was a Canadian club or something like that because it was, you know, you're close to the border and that's that's what's really hot and available up there. I know just in my travels to Michigan for work, you know, there's a much wider array of Canadian whiskeys in general on the shelves in Michigan versus, you know, down here it's bourbon predominant, bourbon and rye. Uh, but when you get in those states that border Canada, uh, there's large sections of uh, the liquor shelves dedicated to Canadian whiskeys and blends at Canadian Club and all their iterations yeah, West, uh, are right there. When I was a kid uh, and sneaking drinks in my dad's Canadian Club, we lived in Minnesota. So there you go. There you have it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Any of those, any of those states bordering Canada, and I would say especially from probably Minnesota East, uh, yeah. I would say there was probably more. Canadian whiskey fans historically there than probably American whiskey that may have changed now with the bourbon boom but you know during prohibition that's all they could get I mean and it was should have been readily available because it's coming right across the border somewhere uh, in that area and it's just one of those things where bourbon was always a dominant southern gentleman drink and I think uh between Scotch and Canadian whiskey and Irish whiskey, that was what's uh, historically dominated the north and the east part of the country for a long time. And some places still does. Yeah, that's cool. All right, we want to jump into sample number two. Sample two, yes, sir. Hey, here's a bit of trivia, guys. Okay. Did you know that given the way the Detroit River bends in between Detroit and Windsor, that the portion of Detroit is actually north of Windsor? Yes. Cool. Yeah, there's a, there's a bridge up around that area. I can't remember. It's the Ambassador around... Bridge. Oh, I thought it was further north. I was thinking, isn't there one closer to St. Clair Shores that's like juts out and is kind of, I feel like I've been, a... there's an area, the, the northern part, northeastern part of Michigan, and maybe it's above St. Clair Shores, but there's a bridge there. When you go over it, the, the, the river and the water is so crystal clear. It looks like you're looking at like a beach in the Bahamas or something. It's like, mm. it's amazing. I had to drive across it coming back one time for some odd reason. I'm sure I was up there for work or something, but this one has a totally different. It does. Yeah. Much, much stronger. Yeah. yeah a little more whiskey like. A, like. Yeah, yeah. More like a, almost like a smoky. Yeah. Yeah, the other one just reminded me more of fruit juice. This is this one has more of your mm -hmm. like a burnt sugar, maybe. Yeah, burnt sugar. Yeah. Still fruity. Still mm -hmm. fruity. Almost like a like a really well cooked fruit pie or something like that. Like a good apple cinnamon pie. Okay. It's kind of weird because this one has a much more aggressive nose, but I find the palate to be weaker than the previous one. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's a good taste, but it man the finish is almost non-existent. Yeah, finish is weak. Kind of um, I don't know. It tastes like some sort of cake or something. It's um, it's pleasant. Love the it's nose. Good. Yeah, yeah. The nose is amazing. The nose is right up my alley. I like. I like the combo of the fruit and like the brown sugar, caramel, cinnamon. That's, those are my favorite noses. Yeah. Definitely has that. Kind of velvety on the on the mouthfeel. So, yeah. Yeah. I will say in the glass, the legs run pretty long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Probably the, they, they run longer in the glass than what you get as far as a finish and a mouthfeel but I, I, I like it i don't i don't dislike it this one's even uh less color than the previous one yeah i know right it's more, interesting more yellow yeah almost like a hay color kind of mm -hmm. 
it's almost like what you would see in like a uh maybe like a cognac or a brandy or like a almost like a corn whiskey you know corn whiskey yeah you use yeah. a barrel and it doesn't get a whole lot of color off of it yep yep this one the first here's i'm going to pull up the first one since i just showed the second one the first one's got a little orange to it yep you know but this one is definitely yellow second one all right hmm. legend what do you think there sir I don't know. It, it's a weird thing because if you were over in a friend's house, if I was at Wes house, Wes's house, he's like, this is what I got to drink. I would drink it. Oh, you know, yeah. it's, 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 it's like a thing. There's nothing offensive about it, but there's also nothing that's like, man, I got to go out and give me a bottle of this. No, like, yeah, there's, yeah, there's, we'd there's, never run out and get it, uh, but yeah, no. it's, that's not bad. I mean, it's no. not, uh, it, it's, I would sip it, but probably in some sort of cocktail or just, Throwing it with some ginger ale and ice is probably the better use of it. Probably, no. Yeah. Yeah, like you're saying, no, I, I think either one of them make good bloody Mary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it would. Uh, in cocktails, I'm a big fan of. I'm not a big fan of overpowering one type of flavor. So, you know, when you get the spice in a bloody Mary, you get the spice from the tomato juice and all the spices that are put in the Bloody Mary. I think you want like a, a liquor that's sweeter to kind of offset that would be, whereas in an old fashioned, I tend to like more of a high rye bourbon to offset the sweetness of the bitters and the orange. Yeah. Type of thing. Yeah. All right. Anybody want to guess, uh, we can take a, a quick vote here. Anybody want to guess, a, let us know which one you like the best and which one you think is the the dusty versus the recent. Okay. Let's start with Bob. I liked uh, number two better. Okay. And there's uh, one flavor that I seem to pick up every time I drink a Canadian club, whether it's the, the regular version or the, the usually have a bottle of that 12 year old sitting around the house it's for 30 dollars. 12 year old whiskey is oh yeah it isn't bad um but uh, the taste that i always seem to pick up on on the current canadian club that i drink is is um prunes and i'm getting a lot of that prune note in number two so i'm going to guess that number two is the current canadian club and okay. Uh, I, I, I do prefer that to to number one. Number one just was a little too um, faint, both on the nose and, and on the palate. This is kind of more muscular all the way around to me. Okay. All right. Legend, what do you think? Okay. Um, I preferred number two. Okay. I just thought it had a little bit more going for it. I also think number two is your Dusty. Okay, so you differ with Bob then. <laughs> I like it. Well, Steve, we got a tie. We, we got a tie. A, currently, we're unanimous with number two is the best, and we have no. a tie for which is the Dusty and which is not. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I host a lot of these events and I always say never vote against uh, Rick because he's always right, but I am going to go against Rick here. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to buck what I always say. I do like number two better. I agree with okay. the group that number two is better, but I think number one is the, actually the dusty. I think that's the dusty, but I don't, again, I don't have a great point of reference here. Uh, yep. uh, so I don't really uh, drink this brand. And like I said, I had, I had it many, many years ago, but uh, I, I don't remember, even remember what it tasted like. So. All right, so it's unanimous that the, and I, so I can't vote on the which is which because I know, obviously. Right. Uh, however, uh, like I always, unless I've had it before, in this case I haven't, for these events, I always wait. I never sample wine pouring unless it's something I've had before simply because I want to enjoy the experience of which one do I like better, even though I know which is which. <clears throat> so I agree. I liked, even though it was a, uh, the nose was so good to me on number two. It offset how number two was a little light on the finish, but the nose is amazing to me. So I will make it unanimous that I'd like number two best. However, uh, there's only one person that got it right. Of course. You should have, 
You should have. <laughs> I should have uh, followed my rule. You should Renner have always your known. rules. Yeah, number right. one is the current Canadian club, and number two is the Dusty. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. Congratulations, Rick. Yeah. <laughs> he's done it again. I don't think he's ever got one wrong, actually. No, I yeah. <laughs> he's undefeated. I thought, huh? I don't know. I just thought this was so strange. I thought this has to be the old one. It's just so so different and fruity yeah, in that. And, to me, of course, I knew ahead of time. Once I nosed and drank number one, to me, it made sense. I felt most of the Dusties, and we've had a couple of exceptions, most of the Dusties have one area of either the nose, the palate, the finish, or something that is significantly different than the, the, the current offering. And in this case, even though the finish was shorter, which I which I actually find probably suits itself with the 60s because distillers were going in with lower barrel proof or lower uh, proof and and they just they just did things a little differently back then and, and they were starting to combat uh, they didn't they, they were starting to combat the, the white whiskey and the white spirits uh, push so it made sense to me that nose was so unique on the second one and the first one, kind of tasted to me it was like it was overall light and crisp and that's kind of what i would figure that a current release would be of canadian clubs so it kind of made sense to me based on but i knew ahead of time so i was biased but yeah yeah interesting so yeah i definitely i do like the taste of uh the the old one better so that's yep. that's really really cool so yeah this was uh this is a this was just something i ran across i would have never even thought of it I didn't even know there were Canadian. That's how little I knew about Canadian club. Right. I had no idea that there were even a such thing as a Canadian club, dusty, much less running around and, and, and obtainable. And I just happened upon it and thought, you know what, I'll grab it for an event. It'll be something odd and different. And worst case scenario is I can, I'll just have it and do what I need to with it. But now that I've opened it and, and drank it, I, I have no problem. I'm probably going to actually mix it with a few different mixers to see if there's a sweet spot combination where it mixes well with yeah. ginger ale or it mixes well with you know some mixer or some yeah i like juice. the ginger ale idea i, I think it makes a good would make a good highball yeah, yeah. i think it would make a great highball so yeah. uh you know worst case is i can mix a 1960 canadian club with ginger ale or sprite or something and make a pretty cool summer cocktail hanging out at the pool or whatever the case is so i thought it was a cool event i i I know we're a big time bourbon and rye group, uh, but I like the idea of, you know, just, just sampling vintage spirits. And, you know, if, if, if I run into a dusty brandy, I run into, you know, things like that, you know, we, we may put them out there and see who's interested in tasting something dusty. That's not a rye or a, or a bourbon. I, I like the idea of that. I'm yeah, always, and where else are you going to have the opportunity to drink 60 year old whiskey right mm -hmm. exactly yeah especially especially for the you know the price of some of these events like it's it's almost a no-brainer you can't this is from 1960 that that means uh that means i was three years old at the time <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah yeah so yeah. i thought it was i thought it was something it was definitely something different uh it's not going to be for everybody but i think for people that just like drinking vintage spirits, not specifically bourbon or rye. Uh, there's going to be some some more opportunities to try other things. We probably won't do any more Canadian whiskeys because we've done that. But I'll, I've got access to brandy. We'll, we'll we'll find whatever we can find that's interesting for the group and and see what we can do some future. I'm game for all of it. Yeah, I love I love it. So it's cool. Yeah, I like I like the idea of of dusty brandy like I, I like brandy i like the the flavor of brandy i like the taste of brandy i would really really like to see how they were making brandy in the 60s or 70s or you know something like that to see uh what that yes. tastes like and, and and what was going on in those times. i drank so, brandy back in the 70s my uh, my grandfather used to make it it was terrible by the way <laughs> I, and I don't know if it's because i was a little kid and i or he just didn't make it he experienced my grandpa liked to experiment with everything he made wine which was also not notably horrible <laughs> but he tried brandy too and uh and i don't my mom agrees that it was bad and again i'm i'm coming from the, they always would let you taste it. My, me and my cousins always got to try and taste all that stuff and it was 
it was not good but i, I don't know that i really liked any of the alcohols back then but yeah because it, it sounds good it's like well, i made this from fruit you know and it's like like no it was not good bob you were yes. saying uh, your dad kept a canadian club in the house and that was your first um taste of whiskey yes sir mine was mine was either um david nicholson 1843 or old Fitzgerald. Yep. yeah those are the two that my dad kept in the house <laughs> yeah my parents had david nicholson 1843 that's the st louis thing so oh the david nicholson yeah but yeah at that time it was stitzel weller so right yeah, he, oh yeah he, he should be drinking it was probably <laughs> phenomenal <laughs> right <laughs> like you know that and old fitzgerald it's like well oh you know, man yeah. it, it's i'll say this you know take the pappy portion out of it the the david nick the david nicholson the old fitzgerald and the cabin stills from stitzel weller like there's some really good dusty turkey. There's some really good dusty, you know, old Forester. There's good dusties in all uh, of the major groups. But for me, it's really, really, really hard to beat Stitzelwell. The old Crow Chessman comes close, but for me, if I had, if if Steve had a bottle of, you know, 1969 old Crow Chessman or 1969 eight or ten year old very old Fitzgerald and said, here, I can, I'm going to give you one of these, take it. I'm probably taking the Fitzgerald, to be honest with you. It, it's, it's hard to beat that Stitzel Weller yeah. stuff. It's, it's really hard to beat that. Yeah. Very cool. If you like that, you know, old, if you like that vanilla caramel butterscotch bomb, like the, that stuff is just so good. It's hard to beat. Yeah. Very nice. Well, great job today, Wes. Really appreciate uh, the, the effort that you always bring to these things. It's fun learning about these things. It's fun going back and tasting history. So appreciate what you do, man. I appreciate you guys. Thanks for joining. Uh, uh, looking forward to the next one. We've got a good one coming up in August. Yes. What do we got? What do we got lined up for August? So in August, uh, we have, uh, it's one of the, it's one of the famous really sought after you know, they're famous for butterscotch bombs. It is a national distillers. Oh, I don't remember the exact year, but I think 1970 old grand 70, 1970 right. old granddad. So I, I want to make sure uh, anybody that, that listens to this, sees this, will advertise it. Obviously, this is one of the ones you don't want to miss. These things are hard to come by, uh, but I was able to, to grab one and I definitely want to share it uh, with the group. Uh, this is going to be one that I think most people, when they drink it, it's going to be a, a game changer. It's going to say, oh, now I understand why people love these Dusties. Like right. the, the Dusty Old Granddads, they're on that short list along with Wild Turkey, Old Forester, uh, the Old Maker's Marks, the Old Stitzel Weller. They're on that short list of of Dusties that make people stand up and say, whoa, wait a minute. That that's, that's what they're talking about. So yeah, I encourage everyone to join into that one. It's going to be a great, plus it's great history. It's one of the iconic brands. Uh, it's one of those brands that's been around for a while. It's changed hands. There's uh, just a lot of history behind it. It's going to be, uh, I'm excited about that event. I'm super excited. It's been one of the ones I've had targeted since we started this and I was able to acquire a bottle and excited to share with everyone. Tuesday, August 3rd is the date, and I'll put a link to it if you're watching this on YouTube. There'll be a link out in the description where you can uh, get on there and sign up, and please get registered for it and be part of it. Taste history with us. All right, gang. Great job today, Wes. We'll say goodbye to our audience. Thank Take you, care, Wes. Everybody. Thanks, everyone. Right. See ya. See ya. Take care.